so uh, I'll, I'll give a, a brief introduction to Anne and, and then we'll get to it. Um, there's uh, been, I think, a couple of uh, husband-wife acts here at Marine Lab. I mean, I think there's one brother and sister act, but I think Anne is the first uh, of a father-daughter act. <laughs> and her, her, her father, uh, Mike Gow, did a, a master's here uh, a little while ago. Um, so, another first. Um, Anne got her bachelor's at Chicago in uh, field of ecology and evolution. Uh, while there, she was also the uh, captain of the uh, varsity women's crew, and she also studied at Dar es Salaam University in Tanzania. And among her many accomplishments, uh, she was a na National Merit Scholar, she was a Mike Bernese Challenge intern. Um, she's also the founder and president of UOG's uh, Green Army and co-founder and board member of the nonprofit group Guam Environmental Alliance. And most recently, uh, she, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Ecological Society of America award, uh, awarded five students nationwide, including Anne, uh, for their uh, contributions to ecology that extend beyond academia and into the wider community. Uh, she's done field work in the Mariana Islands, Palau, South Africa and Tanzania, where she developed her interest in mammal conservation and biology. Uh, she showed me a cool video once of uh, her being chased by a, an enraged African elephant. <laughs> scary. Um, we don't have those type of animals here, but still that led to her interest, I think, uh, to propose uh, the topic of her thesis on uh, the effect of ungulates on the, the forest. Uh, communities of, of the Mariana Islands. So, thank you, Dr. Uh, Hafidei, thank you everybody for being here this morning. I was a little bit worried about giving a defense in the summer because I was worried maybe not a lot of people would be around, <laughs> but I guess those worries were unfounded. <laughs> I'm excited to present uh, to you the results of my, uh, of my master's thesis project on the effects of the invasive ungulates, uh, deer and pigs in particular, on Mariana's limestone forest. Um, I wasn't originally gonna do this, but uh, I had a few people ask me what ungulates are, so I just wanted to clarify that ungulates are hoofed mammals. Uh, this is how my talk is set up today. I think in my intro, it's important to first review um, insular systems and the social interactions that invasive species have with insular systems. And I'll give some examples and why ungulates in the Marianas are examples of invasive species in insular systems. Uh, this will lead me to the development of my questions about ungulate ecology, which focus on these three aspects of their ecology. And I'll describe how I went about answering these questions. Once again, each experiment revolves around these three aspects of their ecology. So first I'll start uh, describing my study areas. And then of course I'll present my analysis and results of the three experiments, uh, beginning with a brief description of the analysis I did uh, for, for each experiment. And then of course my earth shattering conclusions <laughs> Uh, my interpretation of the results, and some implications, I think, for ecology and for management as well. Insular systems are isolated ones. Uh, we find many examples in nature, um, such as lakes, ponds, and forest fragments, but remote oceanic islands are the classic example, and they're unique for a variety of reasons. A lot of research and theory has developed around the island ecology, and there seems to be a general consensus that these islands harbor what are referred to as naive species when compared to continental systems. These islands normally do not have um, native mammals, except for bats. And we notice that in a lot of cases, the effects of invasion are especially pronounced in these systems. 
speaking of remote oceanic islands, this is where my study was conducted on these two islands in the southern part of the Mariana chain, Guam and Rota. And these islands are no stranger to invasive species. Uh, perhaps one of the most infamous examples is the brown tree snake, which was introduced to Guam accidentally and is responsible for the extirpation of almost all of our species of native birds. Far more often on islands, we see examples of mammals having effects on the ecology. And part of this is because we humans tend to travel with our mammals. Uh, we take them to new places because we use them as livestock, as pets, or we like to shoot them. <laughs> and some examples of mammals having effects on systems are through predation. Uh, this is a cat with the um, Galapagos iguana in its jaws. Um, when we see ungulates having effects, normally it's through a vibri, like what these uh, bipedal goats are showing there. <laughs> we have ungulates here in the Marianas. Uh, a number of them have been introduced through the years. You guys may be familiar with carabao and goats. Um, but the two species that I'm going to focus on are the Philippine deer, which was introduced to Guam by a Spanish governor, Mariano Ceballos, in the 1770s. Uh, he introduced them for the purpose of hunting, uh, which uh, the local population readily took up and it's become pretty much a tradition to hunt, hunt deer here. Um, it was so popular they, that they introduced uh, deer from the, species, from the population in Guam to other islands as well, including Sirota in the 1880s. Uh, pigs have been on Guam at least since the 1660s, uh, although I couldn't find a record for when they were introduced to Rota but they're definitely there. So they've been established here for centuries. Uh, can we still investigate their effects? Well, I wanted to show you two photos that kind of piqued my interest in this issue. Um, this is a photo point on Northwest Field of Anderson Air Force Base. And at the time this photo was taken, there was a high, a high abundance of both deer and pigs in the area. But the Brown Tree Snake Research Team planned to construct a snake-proof fence around this area so they could monitor a close population of snakes, thereby eliminating ungulates from this fenced area. And this is that same photo point just 22 months after the barrier was erected. So they certainly seem to be having some effect. But there are very few publications looking at either deer or pigs in the Marianas. Um, a few studies on vegetation have posited that they have an effect on forest regeneration. And um, a study by Ilse Schreiner looked at a number of limestone forest species, and, you, and she used scats to estimate uh, differences in ungulate abundance between sites. And she definitely noticed that a few species were more effective than others when there was higher abundances of ungulates. In fact, ungulate management is stated in the priorities for many of our local agencies and our um, and Department of Defense Natural Resource agencies. Um, but like I said, we're really lacking empirical studies documenting these effects. Uh, this is what our deer looks like. That leads me to my questions for my study. First, do ungulates actually affect forest recruitment? Do they have a measurable effect, measurable effect on seedlings? Another question we can ask about their ecology is do they act as seed dispersers? And then finally, what is their overall effect on forest community composition? To help me de uh, develop each of these questions, I looked to studies in other areas of the world, and I saw that uh, deer species, even where they're native, like in North America, have very pronounced effects on forest regeneration, uh, even if on, um, on once common species. In New Zealand, where red deer were introduced, um, even after culling and management for several decades, these effects on forest regeneration um, were, were so lasting. And of course, pigs are known to affect um, forest regeneration mainly through seed predation and soil breeding. I think this question, whether ungulates act as seed dispersers, is particularly interesting here in Guam because we've lost most of our native seed dispersers. 
precursors with the loss of birds. And we see in other systems that ungulates do disperse seeds. There have been records of cervids or deer species um, dispersing seeds. And then feral pigs can disperse seeds as well. In fact, in Hawaii, they're implicated in helping spread invasive species such as strawberry guava through endozoopory, which just means seed dispersal via gut passage. My third question is kind of a big picture question. Um, increases in ungulate abundance have been linked to changes in forest communities. Um, in other places, they've noticed that they've been linked to decreases in plant diversity. They've been associated with invasive plant assemblages. And people have also noted shifts in size classes, uh, such as a diminished understory or less seedling. <coughs> now I'll explain how I went about answering each of these questions. Uh, but first, let me tell you about my study areas. These are the two islands I worked on, Guam and Rota. Guam is considerably bigger than Rota. And although they're close to each other and they share a lot of the same uh, forest species, I think it's important to point out some key differences between the two islands. Guam has far more people. It also has more of a history of disturbance and urbanization. In fact, Rota didn't, uh, didn't see uh, many effects from World War II. While in Guam, even when you're out deep in the forest, a lot of times you'll still encounter evidence of human impact, such as this grenade that looks disarmingly like a red root. Another obvious um, difference between the two islands is that Guam has lost many of its birds, while Rhoda still retains its forest birds. My first experiment was done in conjunction with the Ecology of Bird Loss Project, and they were looking at avian loss, so they needed to control for ungulate effects in their experimental plots. So I piggybacked on their project, and we duplicated their seedling plots um, in areas where ungulates did have access. So all of the steps that I'll describe were done in conjunction with the EDL project. First, we selected sites in limestone forests. Um, most of Guam's limestone forests are in the northern half, so that's where our sites were located, and then they were spread around Rota. At each one of these sites, we set up paired plots, uh, one fenced and the other unfenced, and we later planted seedlings into these plots. We chose areas with similar canopy cover and similar terrain so we could compare each of the paired plots. This is what one of our exploders looks like. Um, it's made by, sh uh, by putting up chicken wire. We didn't have to use any posts. Uh, we just zip tied the chicken wire to the trees that were already in the area. And we secured the bottom with rocks to prevent pigs from digging underneath. And we had a pretty good success rate with that. We had no ungulate infiltration. <laughs> and of course, our adjacent plots of the same size were demarcated for spiking. We collected fruits from six focal species found in limestone forests on both islands. They're comprised of um, introduced native as well as two endemic <coughs> species to the Marianas. I looked into the literature if there were any clues as to which species would suggest would be, um, would be affected by ungulates, but I really didn't find that much. There were only a few records of them consuming fruits and then foliage for this one species, Prenna. These are the six different species. Uh, I wanted to point out that Marinda and Papaya, although they're both found um, in limestone forests, they're also um, they're also found in disturbed areas, which uh, leads me to believe that they're important primary succession species. After we collected fruit from all of these species, uh, we planted them at our nursery in a mix of peat moss and perlite, and we watered the seedlings. We considered them ready to transplant once the seedlings had, uh, once their first true leaves had emerged, and each species was planted in our prepared plots on the same day. So when we planted Aglaia, we 
planted it in both pots at one site on the same day. We ended up planting about 1,200 seedlings in Guam and Rota each. And for the seedlings that we planted during the dry season, we watered them to make sure that they established. And then uh, we monitored them. We recorded mortality in the fenced and unfenced plots. Um, all of our seedlings were marked with flagging and bird bands so that we could easily find them again. For my next experiment, I collected deer and pig scats and monitored germination from them. All of the scats I collected were from limestone forest areas and I collected throughout the year to encompass multiple pruning periods. After I collected the scats, I planted them at our nursery in the same soil mixture that we used for our seedlings and watered them. And then I counted and identified all the seedlings that germinated from them. For my last, que uh, for my last question, I surveyed um, different sites in the limestone forest to um, to be able to, to describe their forest community composition and their ungulate abundance. The sites I selected for my transect, um, thankfully for our exposure experiment, uh, we had a pretty good geographic distribution across lime accessible limestone forest areas on both islands. So many of my transects are located at the same locations, plus a few extra ones in Guam after I got access to Anderson Air Force Base. At each of these sites, you can imagine the seedling plot in the middle. I ran 60 meter transects um, from either side for a total of about 100 meters, uh, 100 meters in length of transect, and I counted and I identified every plant within a one meter belt on these vegetation transects. In addition, I used a GPS to uh, do a larger walking transect, and I counted all of the scats I found from each animal. Um, in a two meter belt in a square, a perfect square which I can walk in the limestone for. It's a special <laughs> skill. <laughs> <laughs> and now for my analysis and results. Um, I wanted to point out that all of the tests and all of the models and graphs I created, um, I did using our statistical software. I use generalized linear mix models um, to analyze differences in my seedling plots. Uh, this is what a mixed linear model looks like. Uh, each of these effects, um, or each of these terms represents a fixed or random effect um, and how they contribute um, to the observed value or seedling survival that I recorded. Um, the great thing about linear models is you can use both uh, fixed or mixed Sorry. The great thing about mixed models is you can use both fixed and random effects. So for example, if you were doing a laboratory experiment, your fixed effect or your beta terms would be the manipulations you did in your experiment, while your random effects uh, would be, for example, what vials or containers you used. And even for uh, linear mixed models, there are assumptions of normality that you have to meet. But with a generalized linear mixed model, there's a conditional distribution, so you could use it on things like count data. How is this uh, applied to my experiment? My survival Y. I created linear models using species, islands, and fencing as my fixed effects and sites as my random effects. And then I used model selection uh, to determine which of our fixed factors had the most effect or which contributed um, to the best fit model, which I used a Kaiki Information Criterion, or AIC, to determine. Um, when I initially constructed these linear models, um, I found that species had a great effect and species interacted with fencing. In fact, um, species had a greater effect than even our, our fencing treatment. Um, so, what species the seedling was uh, explained more whether or not it would survive 
than whether or not it was actually exposed to opioids. And so to look at this more closely, I ran the models again um, which, with each individual species. And I compared them to see if fencing was uh, actually a significant effect for each. And I found uh, that it was for a number of species. Uh, you'll remember from my um, picture slides, papaya and noni were definitely affected by fencing. And two other species, Kanna and Cytotria, were definitely affected by our fencing treatment. And we can represent this visually by looking at the proportion alive for each of the species, uh, each of the species that I have here down on the x-axis and how the fence and unfenced treatments um, compared. So we see once again that there are big differences in survival for Carica, papaya, for Mirinda, for Premna, and for Psychotria. Meanwhile, Gliandesosperma just wouldn't die. <laughs> <laughs> for my next experiment, uh, this is a list of all the species that germinated from the scat. And this column and seedling is how many of each species germinated. And then N scaps is from how many scaps that this particular species germinated. Um, and there's a mix of both native and introduced species in this. We also noticed that there seems to be a lot more germination from the pig versus the deer scat. Um, but I did select 31 pig scat, more pig scats than deer scats. So if we want, <laughs> we can um, we can test to see if there was truly higher germination from the uh, from the pig scats than from the pig scats. And I did this do, uh, using a binomial test. Um, if we had a probability of half and half of getting either deer or pig, uh, or of getting seedlings from either deer or pig scats, what were the chances that I got what I observed? Only 11 successes for deer scats. And I found that uh, those chances were very small. So I proceeded with analyzing just the data from my pig scats. If you'll recall, I, I said earlier that in Hawaii, pigs seem to, disperse, uh, seem to disperse invasive species. And so we could test for that here in Guam by, um, by doing a, sele uh, a selectivity test. And I used um, Manley Selectivity Index, and I calculated given what adult trees or available resources there are in nature, would we get the ratio of native to exotic seedlings that we had in our sketch? And of course, I calculated a, con um, a confidence interval for that number. And I used the chi-square test to determine if if, uh, if these values were significant. And I found that given our high chi-squared values, there seemed to be selection going on for one or the other. And if we look at our values for our manly selectivity index, we see that there certainly seems to be selection for native, not exotic species, in our pig scats. Um, this is Important, well, it's important to keep in mind that this selection is not describing what the pig's dietary preference is. It's a combination of factors that contribute to this selectivity, including what the pig's dietary preference is, but also how many seeds are per fruit and how many fruit are per tree. Um, for my last question, I kept deer and pig scats separate in my analysis. Remember, these were my estimates for abundance. And then I once again turned to uh, linear models and model selection to look at a number of different characteristics of the forest. And I looked at these based on what I had read in the literature or what I had observed in the forest myself. First, I wanted to point out the relative abundances of scats in the two animals and how, they, at least for this year, they appear to differ between Guam and Rhoda. And in fact, all of the significant results that I found were all between, um, between
between my fourth community characteristic and here, your abundance is only on Guam. So I constructed linear models um, for each of the, the different types of relationships um, that these four characteristics could have uh, with our year abundance. And I used model selection to decide uh, which was the best fit. And these marked with an asterisk are, um, are the types of relationships that I'll be presenting to you. Oh, I also wanted to point out that um, I also tested for outliers with all of my data and using um, von Froning estimates, and I found no outliers. Um, so all of the sites that I surveyed in Guam will be presented. So we speculated that deer have an effect on forestry generation, and we definitely saw seedling mortality in our seedling plots. So what do we see in nature? How does deer abundance um, um, affect total seedling abundance. I found that there was a strong negative log linear relationship between seedlings and deer abundance. And naturally, you might ask that next, was this more from native or from exotic seedlings? So I separated these out, and I saw that with native seedlings, we also observed a strong negative link negative log linear correlation. And then with exotic seedlings, also <laughs> a strong negative log linear correlation. In fact, with an even higher R squared. I also looked at total vine abundance at my site. And vine abundance also had <laughs> a strong negative log linear relationship to deer abundance. Another thing I looked at was the effects on biodiversity, and I used Shannon Diversity Index to estimate um, di plant diversity at my site. Shannon Diversity um, takes into account both species richness, how many species were there, as well as evenness, how many individuals of each species are in the area. And I found a polynomial per linear one or higher values at intermediate levels of, uh, of deer abundance. Well, so what? Uh, what can we take away from this? And I'm going to share with you uh, the major conclusions that I came away with that I think stood out from my results, as well as a few ma management recommendations. <laughs> Uh, the nature of mortality in our seedling plots strongly indicate that deer were responsible. We saw very few examples of rooting, um, such as by pace, um, and uh, because of what we know of the natural history and behavior of pigs, uh, we think that they they affect seedlings um, more, uh, sorry, less discriminately than deer do, while in many other areas deer are known to be selective browsers and they'll eat their preferred species first. And we saw in our human plots that um, all, a number of species were affected by herbivores while a number of species weren't. And then in nature, all of our strong relationships were between deer and our forest characteristics and not between pace and our forest characteristics. Pigs are definitely capable of dispersing seeds. Um, these are just a few pig scat at, um, at our nursery. And this is a pig scat I found out in the limestone forest that has um, noni and a few other species growing out of it. Um, pigs selectively disperse native seedlings. This contrasts with uh, other studies that implicate them in spreading invasive species. And I wanted to point out that some of the native species that they disperse are species that are formally dispersed by birds, such as noni and ficus. However, I would not go as far as to say that pigs are replacing birds ecologically. They can't fly, and 
For example, if you, if you look at um, ficus prolicta, which is um, the strangler fig, um, they're known to be dispersed by birds. And part of their success of, or being dispersed by birds is they, sorry, <laughs> they've evolved to be dispersed by birds. And part of their success is due to the fact that birds can fly over other trees and deposit their seeds on top of other trees. And we know strangler figs are epiphytic species. They grow on top of other, on top of other plants and trees, um, while pigs are depositing them on the ground. Deer are important in shaping forest community composition. We not only saw negative decreases in a number of characteristics like seed length and vines, um, but these decreases were exponential. <coughs> and um, the species that were affected in our seedling plots, like papaya and morinda, I mentioned were important uh, primary succession species. We also saw higher diversity at intermediate levels with deer scat. So there's an important relationship between deer abundance and diversity. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, but um, that hypothesis states that um, you'll get your highest levels of diversity at intermediate levels of disturbance. But many of those studies are, look at um, time since disturbance, for example, after a storm or after an area has been cleared. And very few of those studies look at herbivory as a disturbance. And so I think these results are pretty interesting. I also think that deer um, help to maintain forest gaps. Like I said, they eat um, primary succession species such as morinda and papaya, as well as vines, which are fast growing um, primary succession species. Um, some preliminary research done by uh, the Ecology of Bird Loss team has found that there are more gaps in Guam, forest gaps, like this open area here. And this might have something to do with the loss of our native seed dispersers or loss of birds. So I think the deer probably play um, an important role in this as well. I'm going to say we're different between Guam and Rhoda. I didn't find any significant relationships um, between the forest community characteristics I measured in Rhoda and um, their pig abundances. And this could be due to a variety of reasons. Um, one is that Rhoda still has birds, and perhaps the dispersal by birds is countering the effect we might see from deer herbivory. Um, I also noticed that there was lower seedling survival in our plots, in both the fenced and unfenced plots. If you'll remember um, my um, my table showing the significant effects. Not only was fencing significant for some of them, but island was significant for a lot of them. And uh, we actually noticed more mortality in both our fenced and unfenced plots in Rhoda. And we think this might have had to do with Veronicella's slugs. Uh, I, as well as the other members of the EDL team, noticed an unusually high abundance of them when we were conducting our experiment in Rhoda. And slugs are, in fact, known in other places to be, um, to be herbivores with some serious impacts. Finally, uh, my, management uh, my management recommendations. Um, many of these, these are all sites, uh, different sites in Guam, and many of these sites, even out here, are designated hunting areas. So it seems that the levels of hunting that we have right now, recreation or levels of recreational hunting, are not really doing anything to control deer abundances. And even if they were, you would have to get deer abundances down to almost zero before you would see any recovery in the forest. So fencing and eradication are more likely to be effective. However, <laughs> fencing is quite expensive and um, time consuming to maintain. Uh, I did find that two of these species do just fine when they're exposed uh, to, to deer and pigs. These are Sperma and Aglaea, are both native limestone forest species that were also common on my, in my vegetation surveys, even in places with high deer abundance. Um, so perhaps we could experiment with planting these. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the NIH RISE uh, Research Assistantship Program, which largely funded my, uh, my tuition and salary for most of my um, graduate career, as well as the Micronesia Challenge Young Champions Program. I owe a lot of thanks to the Ecology or Bird Loss Project for labor and equipment, and I thank various agencies for information as well as access to some of my sites. I'd also like to thank my family here at the Marine Lab and the ODC and ACT, as well as my paddling team and the Hatch House Harriers for their moral support. <laughs> <laughs> I owe a lot of credit to my committee. Um, none of them were working on UNDO projects specifically uh, before I came up with these ideas, but they all jumped on board very enthusiastically, and I think they went far above and beyond what you would expect from any normal committee member. And just a shout out to Dr. Connell for his intermediate disturbance hypothesis. <laughs> the people who by far deserve the most thanks, of course, <laughs> <laughs> are my family. If I shared with you the different things I'm thankful for about them, we'd be here until tomorrow. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to open it up for questioning. Area up on Anderson Air Force Base, where they've fenced an 
the lemonade done to it. In fact, it was one of my data points. <laughs> um, I had a couple questions about your standard uh, index okay. and your results. Sure. Um, it looks like the last point was like a single. Point. I know, it looks like an outlier. <laughs> Well, not so much an outlier, but a very influential point. Yeah. That curve, so. I'm just wondering if you could explain what was responsible for that particular point. Is it because species richness is this lower? Point, it's, go ahead. Species richness and even if was much lower at this site. This site is right above Chiragi Basin on Anderson Air Force Base, and it is sinking up here. I, you cannot, I was constantly hearing them. Their scout was everywhere. Um, and there were just a few species that were uh, that were abundant at the trees. Very few species. You just didn't have another site that had that density of scat. Not quite. So if you could find more, you might find that. I would imagine so. So your whole hypothesis sort of makes sense logically, but intermediate was. Yeah, I think higher. there's a lot of things you can. You can look at this graph for <laughs> for days. Uh, there's also more variance. Um, so maybe other factors besides um, besides deer abundance are coming to play in determining diversity at low deer abundances. So then after what I like to call my deer threshold, they you see a decrease. Any other questions? <laughs> so you, you didn't have any evidence of rooting by pigs in your uh, fence on the fence Just a, a few, yes. But is that you think that might have something to do with the fact that uh, it was very karsty where you put all your fence spots? I think uh, pigs are surprisingly capable of knocking around sharp rocks. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know that that could have been a factor. I didn't have any. We didn't have any plots out in like more disturbed areas or softer soil. Um, yeah, I mean that's where I usually see most rooting. Well, what was interesting is that, I mean, you saw those pictures of scat. There's, I mean, there's tons of plants coming out of these. But I, you know, I didn't really notice like an increase in any of these species in the forest or anything like that. And a lot of these species, like papaya and marinda, are the ones I found were controlled by deer. So I don't know if there's kind of an interaction going there. Um, so I don't know if pigs have <laughs> value as dispersers. Uh, they're certainly not replacing birds, uh, but they yeah. might be our only dispersers, <laughs> really. I did want to <laughs> point out that although I found those like a small variety and much lower um, numbers of pig scats, it might be that scats are just not a good indication of what pig populations are really like, and not really that there are less pigs or anything like that. Um, I do know from uh, you know looking at scat a lot that they uh, seem to decompose more quickly than the deer scats when I put them in seedling trays near the 
the these cats um, we deposed and the deer the cats were they remain in their pellet form for quite a long time. I mean, if you could really do it, uh, go out and actually count the animals. Um, I know people have done it with spotlighting. I just didn't have the resources to do that. Um, trail cameras. Oh, or trail cameras. Uh, I did set up a trail camera at one of my seedling plots to see if there were deer or pigs coming in, and unfortunately, they were too sneaky for my camera. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept getting butterflies for some reason. <laughs> Um, sorry, I don't have a good answer for what to... Um, I, I've read papers that said that fresh sign are the best indication for um, uh, for pig abundance. So not just scats, but new scats and fresh rooting, but I think it's hard to determine what's, what's new and what's old. How about sign Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> uh, especially, for, you know, they might not be rooting as much in very karsky. I saw the ad that, that um, the fact that her use of scat as a measure of abundance and the fact that she was able to account for over three quarters of the variation in abundance of forest community characteristics by that measure um, argues that it's, it's a pretty good measure of, of your abundance or, or, or some really tight quota. I did know whether I thought it looked old or fresh, um, but I wasn't really sure <laughs> if I was if I was estimating that correctly. Um, uh, so I counted all the scats, and I think I think it was a pretty good representation of, um, if not abundance, how often deer were in the area. Do you, do you have any? I guess what I'm what I'm around is we've got a, a trend now. That's really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any idea of how long that persists here before it disintegrates? I well, I believe the the deer scats, which I was watering daily, <laughs> um, I think they persist for at least three or four months. One of the things you use all of the scats in the spot, yeah? Every time no. you go with them? No. No, yeah. <laughs>
about the threat scenario yeah. like they do in the states. Do you think that that might have a better impact on the overall number, or do you still think that that would really have a significant impact? I just don't think there are enough hunters on Guam to control the deer. I could tell you. I think it's not necessarily the the hunt itself. I think what we've done is, is liberalize it quite, quite a bit. Uh, we, we've increased the take limit. We've increased the take period. Uh, I think we're going around the world. We're going to unlimited, turn into another unlimited season this time around in July and last year. I think what's real important is that you look at different areas and overload their areas. Up. I think the fact that they're limited to certain areas uh, cuts down on the, probably the impact on seeing have, uh, whereas there are other areas that remain protected, remain isolated, or out of bounds for the hunting industry. You increase the amount of time, and then you, you, you do the same thing in that regard. So I think there's a benefit. And I think <coughs> the bottom line is, is that it's really a social, it's also a social thing in terms of allowing, you know, the community to add to the research. That's your first hit, I think, as a manager. The next hit is to look at areas that you want to protect and recover do whatever you need to do in those areas. And, and I just wanted to point out that there's yeah. there's still hunting going on, not in season. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we've also done uh, uh, the, uh, what we call revocable permit, death permit, uh, and, and hunters or whoever the conservation volunteer has to be able to